Hello and welcome to the 2021 K-State Garden Hour series. We're happy you all joined us today. This is your first time with us, welcome. And if you're a regular, thanks for coming back and joining us. We started this webinar series in 2020 as a way to share extension gardening through education through COVID. With much success, we've decided to continue into 2021. This webinar is hosted by K-State Research and Extension. And my name is Kelsey Hattisall and I'm the horticulture agent for River Valley District and I will be your host today. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State and most of us have a background in horticulture education. But most of all, we all have a love for educating and sharing important gardening and landscape topics. Before we get started, we do have a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Please use the Q&A feature for questions related to this presentation. This is where we will look for questions in the Q&A session after the presentation. You will see the button along the bottom tab that says Q&A. Just click on that and you'll be able to enter your question in there. Our moderators for today are Rebecca McMahon and Tom Bueller. They will be sharing information through the chat throughout the presentation and they will help us facilitate the question and answer portion after the session. This webinar will be recorded and we will post it on our K-State Garden Hour website. We typically upload additional resources related to each topic as well. If we share any links through the chat, we will also put them on the website. Our website is also where you have access to the previous topics as well as the, the list of upcoming topics for the 2021 series. Snap a photo of how you are watching this webinar and be sure to like, share, and use the hashtag K-State Garden Hour to help us promote program. All right, today's topic is herbs from seed to seasoning. I am pleased to introduce our speakers today, Cassie Homan, the horticulture agent from Post Rock District, and Ashley Swati, the nutrition, food safety, and health agent from Post Rock District. Please give us a few minutes while we trans transition to their presentation. All right, thank you, Kelsey. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, does that look good? Looks good, Cassie. Okay, thank you. Well, welcome everyone. I am very excited to talk about herbs today. And we have an awesome presentation because you're not only going to learn a little bit about growing herbs and um, having them in your garden, but also cooking with them. So Ashley Swati is here. And for the second half of the program, she'll talk about um, using herbs and recipes. So we have a fun webinar planned for today. All right, I'm going to start out with a just a quick thing to get out of the way before we get too far. How do you say herb? So you might say it differently than me, and that's totally okay. So actually, in Great Britain, a lot of times it is pronounced with the H, so herb. Um, but in the United States, we often pronounce it just herb. So either way is fine. The dictionary actually um, has the H in parentheses because you can pronounce it or omit it. So either way is great. So you might be wondering what exactly is an herb and why do we use them? Well, it is a plant that we use for the flavoring agent. So if you've ever been around herbs or touched them, you know that they have a strong scent and really smell good and taste good. So that's why we like to have them in our gardens and in our recipes. Most of the time it's the leaves of the herbs that we use, but you also might think about some seeds or flowers or roots of the plant that is used. So when I think of a seed, often we think of like spices, um, mustard seed, dill seed. For flowers, my mind automatically goes to lavender. It's a very beautiful purple flower. And you have probably even eaten the root of a plant. So if you've ever cooked with ginger, that is the root. And one of my favorite spices, cinnamon, also comes from a plant, the bark of the plant. So one of the great reasons, um, to grow herbs and use them is because they're so versatile and you can really use the, the whole plant. So just a, a little bit about an herb versus a spice. For this first part of the program, I'll be talking about the green leafy part of the plant, which is what we often refer to as an herb. And then Ashley will also be talking about some spices. So they, they come from the same plants, but it's just a little bit different plant parts. So a spice is often like the seeds, the berries, the dried leaves or fruit of 
of the plant. So they're pretty similar, but just know when we're, when we're thinking about growing herbs, it's often um, the green leafy part. And then Ashley will talk a little bit more about flavoring with spice. So herbs have a long history. Um, actually, some of our oldest horticulture writings um, are about herbs and they date back to like um, 2700 BC. So it's really fascinating stuff that you can find on herbs. They were used for seasoning food, curing illnesses, um, dyeing fabrics, fragrance. They used them to cover up the taste of meat before they had refrigeration. So that just goes to show um, how strong and flavorful they are. So they were popular back then and, and they're even popular now as well. You often hear people using essential oils, which come from herbs. Um, they're great for lots of reasons. I will say that if you are using them for any health reasons, that's great, but make sure you are contacting or working with your physician um, before you're self-treating with any type of herb or essential oil. So one of the reasons I'm excited to talk about herbs and tell you about them is because they are very easy to grow. Um, pretty low maintenance overall. These three points are kind of what I like to focus on. And the first is sunlight. So there are a few exceptions, but most of the herbs will want about six to eight hours of sunlight a day. So we talked about those essential oils and the leaves, and they will be produced the most and the best when they're getting full sunlight. There's a few exceptions. So some herbs like um, parsley and cilantro, they can do okay in the shade, but um, try to get them as much sun as possible. And then for soil, they really do well in many soil conditions. Um, good garden soil is best, but if you have kind of a poor soil situation, oftentimes herbs will still thrive. And they don't need a lot of fertilizer. So if you actually have high fertile soils or use a lot of nitrogen, you might be losing some of the flavor of your plants. They'll grow really big and really bushy, but not be as flavorful. So really easy, um, great plants to grow. And then the last point to think about is drainage. So herbs can be susceptible to some molds and root rot. So just make sure you use a moist soil, but make sure it drains well. So if you have a really heavy clay garden, you might want to amend that soil or um, grow them in pots. Pots are a great option as long as there's drainage holes in the bottom. All right, so you probably wanna think about where you're gonna plant your herbs. And it's important to note where herbs are native to. A lot of them come from the Middle East, so they prefer hot, dry climates, which is usually great in Kansas, right? In July and August, we are pretty hot and dry, so they, they tend to do well. You might wanna think about locating them close to a kitchen so you can easily you know, go to your back porch if it's right by your kitchen and clip some off for your recipes. Um, you can kind of think outside the box. It's awesome to do them in containers or in flower boxes. Um, herbs are actually really beautiful. They can have nice ornamental value. So you don't have to you know, hide them in the back with your tomato plants and your um, vegetable garden. They can, they can add some nice interest to the landscape. And then you will want to check water every once in a while and check for insects and diseases. But honestly, herbs don't get very many um, insects or diseases. So that's another reason why it's great. They're great plants for beginner gardeners or if you want some easy gardening. Um, the only thing to maybe look out for again is that mildew um, or root rot if you get a little bit too much water on your plant. So when you're thinking about planting herbs, you can start them several ways. Probably the easiest and one of my favorite things to do is just buy some transplants. Um, you can use get them at greenhouses, um, big box stores, often even the grocery store will have little transplants in the produce section. So that's probably the easiest way. And if you're impatient, like I am with gardening, it, it gets you off to a good start. But you can start them from seeds and then perennials can be divided or you can take cuttings of them. So we'll talk a little bit more about those. So if you're starting seed from seeds, it can be a little bit of a slow process, especially if you're wanting to grow perennial herbs. So if you're thinking of doing like rosemary, lavender, mint, just know it will take a little bit longer. 
So you can see in this picture, this is mint seed next to a penny and it's really, really small, almost like dust. So um, just know if you, if you want something to get started quicker, you might buy a transplant or divide them. Um, but the seeds can be started inside in late winter. So as early as February, you can get them started. You will want to use like an artificial lighting system so that they, they grow tall and strong. And then herbs like a cooler environment while they're germinating, so about 60 degrees or so. So this is again for more perennial herbs. Some of the annual herbs really do great from seed and you can put them right into the garden and they'll grow well. So we'll, we'll talk about those here in a second. So one awesome thing about herbs is that you can propagate them really easily. So if you have perennial herbs that are growing really well in your garden, um, it's a good idea to propagate them. So they, they benefit from being divided about every three to five years. You can do it in early spring. This picture, I think it's probably some chives. They, if you dig up the whole clump and then cut it into smaller pieces, you'll have more plants for your, your own garden or that you can share with a friend. You can also take cuttings. So that's just clipping off some of the healthy tip growth of the plant and um, letting those root and then planting them outside the next spring. And then a, a cool technique you can do with herbs is to layer them. That's what this bottom picture is showing. And you can do it with any, almost any perennial that has kind of flexible branches. And you just bury a stem about three to six inches deep you can anchor it with a wire or a little pin and it will start growing roots. And then the next um, spring, you can attach that from the, or detach that little plant from the parent plant and plant it somewhere else. So that's a really fun way to get more plants out of the plants you already have. And often this will, will kind of happen on its own. You might see if you have a clump of lavender or chives that another little clump is growing beside it that you can go ahead and dig up and give to a friend. So I have a couple notes about growing herbs indoors. Usually growing them indoors, you'll have a little bit of a harder time. They won't be as productive. Sometimes they're, they're more leggy and sparse, but it can be done. Just make sure that they have like a strong south facing window or a supp supplemental light would work best. So this little system, they make lots of different like kitchen countertop systems that you can use to grow herbs indoors. Um, if you're just using a window like this, you might want to take them outside during the summer so that they're growing bigger and stronger and getting that, that rush of growth in the, in the summertime. Okay, so we're going to go over a few of the popular annual herbs and a few perennial herbs. But I do want to mention that these terms are kind of loose terms with herbs. Um, many annuals will self-seed. So at the end of the season, they drop their seed and it comes up next year. So, um, and then some perennials won't survive our Kansas winter. So you can treat them as an annual. So just know they're kind of loose terms, but it's fun to experiment and see what, what grows and what does well in our gardens. Okay, so we'll start with basil. And this is probably the, the king of all the herbs. It's one of my favorites. Um, and it, there are so many varieties and, and fun plants to try out. You don't have to just get the traditional sweet leaf basil. They are very aromatic um, plants, but they are tender. So they, they like the heat. Um, I know this time of year we get excited and we wanna plant all of our tomatoes and peppers and basil plants, but it is, it's a little bit early. You don't wanna put them outside until the night temperatures are about 55 or above 55. So I know this morning when I woke up, it was not that warm. I think it was about 44 degrees in Beloit this morning. So still a little cold for some of our, our summer heat loving plants. Um, basil gets really beautiful flowers on the plant, but if you want to keep harvesting the leaves and have nice tasting leaves, you will want to pinch that flower off so that they continue to actively grow. Um, like I said, there's many, many types. If you've never tried purple basil before, um, definitely, definitely try that, especially if you're a K-State fan. Um, it doesn't have as much flavor, but it's such a beautiful plant in the landscape. 
So, and then Ashley will talk a little bit more about cooking with these herbs, but basil goes well with pastas, tomatoes, um, so many recipes. Okay, the next one is cilantro. And this is also the dried seeds of cilantro are called coriander. So if you look at this as the, the scientific name right here, you can probably see where the coriander name comes from. So I do want to mention a little fun fact about cilantro. I personally really like it, but I know some people absolutely hate it and say that it tastes like soap. So I did a little bit of research about that and it actually is um, your genetics. So if you have a certain olfactory receptor gene, um, it will allow you to taste the soapy flavored aldehydes in the leaves. So that might mean you have a, an extra sense of smell if you're able to taste that, but thankfully I think it tastes really good. So um, when you're growing cilantro, it actually is one that does great from seed. You can put it right into a container or into the garden. It can handle a little bit of shade just because the leaves of cilantro are really delicate. And it's a cool season plant. So it's one that is hopefully doing great now if you have it planted and in heat, it will get better and go to seed. So, which is fine if you want some coriander seeds. And then I think it pairs well with lots of things, but. I always think of salsa with cilantro. All right, the next one is dill. So it is a tall feathery plant with really beautiful um, umbel shaped, umbrella shaped leaves. It's easy to grow from seed, but if you've ever heard the term dill weed or called it dill weed, that's because the seed shatters really easily. So. Um, when you plant it, make sure you're okay with it coming back um, in that spot for several years because the seed will likely shatter. Um, all parts of the plant are edible. I always think of this as um, the pickle herb. Um, growing up, my grandma would can pickles, and I think she'd, she'd put the flour, the seeds, everything in the jar. And, um, it's so yummy. I think it goes well with pickles and lots of other dishes. So, And I do want to mention that um, herbs are great for pollinator plants. So dill is one that will really get a lot of um, butterflies on it. Okay, the last annual we'll go over is parsley. So it's another one that has pretty delicate leaves so you can get away with using part shade. Um, it does need well-drained soils as well just because they, they can get that mildew. The seed is short-lived. So it's one that you might wanna purchase new seed every year. And then again, there's, there's different types. There's the, the curly leaf parsley and the flat leaf, like Italian type of parsley. I kind of think of the curly one more as like a garnish on your plate. Um, it doesn't have as good a flavor as like the, the flat leaf one um, that goes well with like potatoes, eggs, salads. Um, and this is another one that the pollinators love it. So if you want to have some nice butterflies and caterpillars in your garden, plant some parsley. Um, if you've ever heard of the parsley worm, it's the black swallowtail caterpillar. They love this plant. So make sure you are planting a little extra so you can give some to the caterpillars and save some for yourself. Okay, so some perennial herbs. Most of these are, are kind of a tender perennial, so they will benefit from some protection over the winter. Or if you don't want to deal with that, you can just grow them as annuals and plant them year after year. So one of my favorites is chives. And this is in the allium family, which is um, the onion family. And it's so it has thick kind of bulbous underground stems, but we, we do harvest the leaves and even the flowers are edible. Um, it kind of reminds me of ornamental allium. So I think those flowers are really beautiful and you kind of get similar purple um, little puffball flowers. So it's, it's kind of fun in the landscape. Um, this is one that grows in clumps and it's a perennial. So it's easier to start it from division or if you get a transplant because with seeds, it can take a long time, almost up to two years to get a fully established plant. So if your neighbor or your friend has a nice clump of chives, it might be a good idea to divide it and you can share it. 
um, you can harvest it like this picture shows, um, leaving a little bit one to two inches off the ground. That way it will continue to grow back. And you don't have to harvest it like this. Feel free to just um, take a little bit as, as much as you need and um, you know cut it and then come back and cut it again. So this goes well with potatoes, soups, stews, honestly, I think anything. I, I love kind of the oniony taste that it gives. All right, the next one is mint. And um, mint has a square stem. So a lot of um, herbs in the Lamiaceae family have that characteristic. So if you're ever trying to identify a plant, that's an easy way to, to look at it. There are so many varieties of mint. It's one of my favorite to try something new every year. There's orange mint, chocolate mint, um, and then there's like peppermint, spearmint, catnip, so many different types. So definitely experiment and try, try new varieties. Um, I do have it in bold right here. Uh, this plant can be kind of invasive. So just be aware of that before you start planting it all over your, your yard and garden. Um, you might wanna grow it in containers if you're worried about it spreading, but it, it is pretty easy just to, to dig up as well. The roots are um, kind of rhizomes that spread and they don't go too far into the soil. So it requires full sunlight if you want those optimum oils, that really strong mint taste. And then this is one that takes a little bit more moisture just because of those shallow roots. Um, and then it, I think it goes well with lots of different things. I think of like um, drinks like tea and, and mint lemonade. Okay, lavender is next. And there, again, there's lots of varieties of lavender you can try. This picture I think is just really beautiful. It's of a lavender field in France. But I, I actually know there's lots of um, lavender fields in Kansas. I think there's one in the Salina area and um, a couple throughout the state. So if you've never seen la lavender production on a larger scale, definitely go, go take a look. Um, it does well in Kansas because it can tolerate slightly higher pH. And often, if you've ever done a soil test, at least in my area of Kansas, we, we have pretty high pH. They have beautiful kind of silvery gray leaves that create that nice contrast with the purple color. And then they're obviously very, very scented. I think we all can recognize what lavender smells like. It's great for perfumes and potpourri. And then also cooking, you can do jellies, teas, lemonade. Um, you might want to look at what species you're getting because that kind of can affect the hardiness of the plant. Okay, the last um, perennial is rosemary. It's a beautiful plant that is an evergreen. It has that, that pine-like kind of spicy flavor. Again, it likes the warm, dry climates. Um, and I have on here that it's not hard in Kansas. I have heard of people having it come back year after year, especially probably if you're in the southern part of Kansas or if it's in a protected location. But if you haven't had luck with it overwintering, you could grow it in pots and bring it inside over the winter. Um, it's one that propagates well from cuttings or divisions. And then it goes well with like, I think of meat and potatoes with rosemary. And a lot of people um, might not be familiar with the flowers. It gets some really nice um, flowers on it as well that have some ornamental value. So like I mentioned, those perennials will want some winter protection just because our, our winters can be unpredictable. And one day it's um, freezing and the next day it warms up and um, that can kind of cause some stress to the plant. So they do benefit from having a loose mulch over them doesn't have to be anything fancy. This picture shows just some shredded leaves over a rosemary plant maybe. And um, using about four inches of mulch, that will help so that the roots don't heave out of the soil when it freezes and then thaws, um, which is very typical in our, our Kansas weather. All right, I did want to throw in a slide about landscaping. Um, I think I said earlier, herbs are just really beautiful and you don't have to hide them with your tomatoes or your um, green bean plants that might not be as attractive. Um, they get really beautiful flowers and have 
texture, which creates um, some contrast in the landscape. So this picture, this bottom one shows some parsley growing along with some pansies. It just makes a nice border. Um, all these plants are great for pollinators. If you need a tall backdrop, you can use things like lemongrass or fennel, um, great borders for your landscape. And then obviously the flowers, um, basil, rosemary, lavender just has really beautiful flowers for your landscape. Okay, I have a couple notes on harvesting herbs. So once they get growing and are looking good during the summer, you can harvest them. And the general rule is to do that when they have the optimum amount of essential oils in the plant. So that's when they're actively growing. It's a great idea to do it in the morning, kind of once the dew has dried, so you won't get any of those mildew issues. And then you can really do it multiple times throughout the summer. It's not a one and done thing. It's um, great to just go out and experiment, clip some off and throw them in your, your cooking and see what happens. Um, the other general rule is to, to clip them prior to blooming. So that's when they, they taste the best, like we talked about basil and cilantro. Once they, they start um, going to seed, they don't taste as good. But if you are harvesting for flowers, such as lavender or rosemary, do that as soon as the bloom opens. And then I do want to point out this, this picture because this is a great way to store your herbs, um, sort of like a, a flower arrangement and a vase with some water. So I know we can get kind of nervous about cutting our plants. Um, we, we get these beautiful basil plants or lavender and we're, we're scared to kind of cut them and use them, but it often does benefit the plant. So when we're, we're pinching them back, it's growing bigger and bushier. So don't be afraid to, to harvest some and use them in your recipes. Um, annuals can be cut back two to three inches or even more if they're, they're big and actively growing. Um, this basil, this picture is a great, great way to prune. She's just doing it right there at a node. So that's where the leaves meet the, the stem. So that's, that's the best way, but you probably won't hurt the plant if you're just pinching it or picking off certain leaves. Um, they usually grow pretty big and vigorous and you can, can cut it back. Um, perennials also, once they get established, you can cut them back and harvest them. And um, like we mentioned, the, the cut method is a good way to store your herbs. Um, they, they need some water um, to, to continue to be good. So that is all I have on gardening and um, harvesting herbs. So I'm going to pass it over to Ashley. Ashley Swati is our food, nutrition, and health safety agent. So she's going to talk about some great um, ways to use herbs and spices in the kitchen. So, and I think we have a poll here before we get started. That looks good, Ashley. Cassie, does that still look good? Yep, I can see it. How long do you want the poll to go? Or you can go ahead and start. Okay. Yeah, I can. All right, I will get going. Thank you all for joining us today. I am so excited to take the knowledge that Cassie just taught us and get you guys cooking with some more herbs and spices. So today we're gonna to be talking about different blends and different seasonings to jazz up really whatever we make at home. So let's dive in. I, unlike the other individuals on the panel, I do not have a background in horticulture education or really horticulture. My focus is nutrition, but 
you know what, Cassie and I really like to pair up because both of our focus areas can go hand in hand a lot. So here we go. So let's face it, guys. Nobody really wants to eat bland food, right? I know I don't. So why not jazz up our healthy plates using herbs and spices instead of some of our go-to ways that we flavor food with salt, fat, and sugar? So when we use herbs and spices instead, it's not only tastier, but it's so much healthier. So it adds color and variety to our meals, and it gives us a way that we can healthfully jazz up fruits and vegetables so that we eat more of them. Because overall, we just don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. And personally, for a lover of fruits and vegetables, I just don't know why, but I I am up for trying anything to get more people to eat more fruits and vegetables. So fruit, um, herbs and spices are the way to do that. So, and taste is really the biggie because the reason why we eat what we eat and when we go to the store and purchase foods, we buy them on taste. And that's really the main factor here. So let's focus on jazzing it up so we can eat more of the good stuff. So let's kick it off and see what spices we can use instead of looking to sugar or other sweeteners. So I want you guys to look at that oatmeal up there in the right-hand corner. Doesn't that just look so good? <laughs> to me, I love oatmeal because I jazz it up with fruits and other spices like allspice, cardamom, and cinnamon. But I know a lot of people, when, when they think of oatmeal, they just kind of think of bland, boring oatmeal. But I don't want you guys to think of things like that. There's so many easy ways that we can jazz it up in a healthful way right here. Like that just really makes me want oatmeal right now. So a reason why we should trick our taste buds using these different spices is because we have a pretty small limit of how much added sugar is recommended for us to eat. And overall, we don't eat as many fruits and vegetables as we should, and we also eat too much added sugar in general. And our daily added sugar limits for men is nine teaspoons a day, and women is six teaspoons a day. So whatever measures we can take throughout the day by using these herbs and spices to trick our taste buds instead of using sweeteners is the way to go. So now let's chat about salt. So instead of going to just the salt and any other salt mixes that we use to add flavor to our food, let's try some of these different things to add a little bite to our foods to give it that flavor. So we can try pepper, garlic powder, curry powder, cumin, dill seeds, basil, ginger, coriander, and onion powder. So that garlic powder there is in bold because I'm not talking about garlic salt, garlic powder is what we wanna use. And um, sometimes it will be explicit like this one says garlic salt, but we really wanna be detectives and always look at that nutrition facts label when we are purchasing spice mixes here. So if you guys can see it, I know the, the lighting on that picture is kind of funny, but. The sodium here for a fourth of a teaspoon is 450 milligrams or 19% of our daily amount of sodium that's recommended for us. So that is so much salt that we can definitely get out by just using garlic powder or fresh garlic. Okay, and I know some of you guys are going to maybe think I am crazy, <laughs> but whenever I Whenever I give this idea to people, they're kind of, they don't really believe me, but you don't need to put salt in the water when you're cooking pasta. And I cook, I cook quite a bit of pasta guys, but you will get that taste back by flavoring with basil, oregano, parsley, pepper, and an Italian seasoning blend. You're going to have so much flavor in here. You're not going to miss the salt. And this Italian seasoning blend, we will discuss that in a couple slides. And so you'll get it to keep in your cupboard. Now, I am not gonna go into a lot of detail here about antioxidants. We've only got you for an hour, 
but I will cover the basics to kind of sweeten the deal for you guys to use herbs and spices. So studies show that many popular herbs and spices are sources of antioxidants. So antioxidants are those compounds that play an important role in neutralizing free radicals and reducing cancer risks. So some of these are oregano, sweet marjoram, sweet bay, dill, thyme, rosemary, and sage. So pretty popular um, herbs on here that um, I use quite a bit, and I hope you guys will be motivated to use even more too. But Cassie noted this also, but I wanted to really add it again, but it's so important to talk to your physician before basing your nutrition and health decisions on herbs and spices, and always tell your physician about what herbs and spices you may be using. So I cannot really give any kind of presentation, especially talking about food, without touching on food safety. And this right here, this topic, it is on hand washing, but it's directly related to how we spice up our food. So right here, this study was taken from 2018, or this news release was taken from 2018, but it pretty much says that we are not washing our hands enough or effectively enough. So right here, a new study from the USDA shows that when it comes to hand washing before meals, consumers are failing to properly clean their hands 90% of the 97% of the time. So, and this is because we are rushing, which can lead to cross contamination. So it's always important to wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds before preparing food and after working with poultry and other meats. But this really comes into play because if you've ever watched a cooking show or if you cook a lot at home too, I just cringe when I see uh, chefs touching raw meat and poultry, shaking different kinds of seasonings out, and they didn't wash their hands after touching the raw meat and poultry. That is a huge cross-contamination risk there because when we touch uh, meat and poultry with our hands and then we touch the shaker, what we're shaking on to jazz up our food, those germs are then on that shaker. So what can we do? Well, first off, we need to wash our hands a lot more and more effectively, but then plan ahead. Easy steps, we can just measure out our spices before handling the meat. You can measure them out and just get those little dishes or just put everything in a dish ahead of time and put it right into your, right into what you're putting your herbs and spices on. And then make sure you clean your containers before returning them into storage because you don't want dirty and contaminated herbs and spice shakers in your cabinets. That just will not be good. So now to give our different foods some flavorings, here's what we can add to them. And these are not tell all lists here. You can definitely try different things, but these are just general different herbs and spices that we can use to jazz up different foods. So we've got beef, um, some different ones, sage, thyme, bay leaf, and that picture there. I just think that thyme is beautiful. So I added it and pork, garlic, onion, sage, pepper, and oregano. I always love these uh, in-person programs when Cassie and I teach this in person because Someone might have a, a totally different herb or spice that I've never thought of pairing with different foods. And so it's just great to get different ideas from everybody. But this is great too. We've got a chat. <laughs> so flavoring lamb and poultry, we can use curry powder, garlic, rosemary, and mint. Mint is such a, such a fun one to jazz up different teas and drinks with. And poultry, of course, we've got poultry seasoning rosemary, sage, thyme, ginger, and fish. Fish is definitely a healthy um, lean meat that we can use, a lean protein. And right there, I'm, I'm knowing that she is washing her hands right there in that picture, but curry powder, dill, dry mustard, marjoram, pepper, of course, and carrots. These next 
veggies are really what we want to focus on because we want to jazz up our vegetables in a healthful way. So with carrots, you can see them all there. They can give carrots a totally different palette just on what we use to jazz it up with there. And now corn and potatoes. I, I kind of think it's silly, but when I think of potatoes, as Cassie said, chives are what you think of, a potato with chives on it, but I forgot to add it on there. But um, dill, garlic, paprika, parsley, lots of great different things that we can jazz it up with. And of course, when we're jazzing these up, we're not needing to add the salt and the sugar and the fat with it. It will have flavor with the herbs and spices. Uh, in a couple months, I bet you all are going to, because you are such great gardeners and gr have green thumbs, you are going to have summer squash out your ears and you're going to be wondering, you're going to be calling your extension office wondering how to jazz up your squash because you're looking for different recipes. Well, here we go. You can jazz up your squash with cloves, curry powder, nutmeg, parsley, sage, marjoram, and rosemary and then winter squash, cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, and onion. Lots of great things. Or you can also give it to a neighbor as I bet you do. And tomatoes here, I, I love this picture because we think of tomatoes and basil, or I do, and I can just smell the basil from this picture. But as you can see, basil is that first, first herb right there with it. But Tomatoes are great to pair with bay leaf, chives, dill, marjoram, parsley, paprika, pepper, tarragon. And one thing I really want you guys to do is just try different things and don't be afraid to um, jazz things up with herbs and spices you haven't used before. So next, I wanted to share a couple DIY seasoning blends with you from various extension sources. These two here are from our friends at Mississippi State, and this resource has several different others that I didn't get on here, but it will be available where every other resource will be where the webinar is going to be housed. This Greek seasoning blend is going to be perfect for any Mediterranean dish or vegetable that you would like to jazz up. And I bet you guys won't have any trouble finding something to use with this barbecue rub and blend. As you probably know, if you cook a lot of barbecue, there's a lot of sodium in different rubs and barbecue sauces and blends, but I really encourage you guys to try this, this blend out and see what you think. And now these DIY blends, the Mexican blend and the Italian blend are from North Dakota State University, and that will also be on that resource list. But what I do with these is I mix these up and I keep them in little baggies or a tightly sealed container. And I have them ready to go. If say I am making, here's your Italian blend to jazz up that pasta, but say I'm making pasta or fajitas. I can use however much of this seasoning mix that I already have ready to go. It is fast, it's healthy and simple and ready to go. I can use as much mix of that as I want and I don't have to worry about um, any salt that comes with it. So, and then I also wanted to share this ranch because ranch is kind of a staple in some people's homes. And I also wanted to share this comparison to a ready-made mix in grocery stores. So this ranch mix is also from North Dakota State University and it's very tasty and you're gonna to wanna to mix it with a low fat yogurt or sour cream. And then I like to put this comparison here because as you can see, there is 200 milligrams of sodium in here and 11 grams of fat. And one of these servings is two tablespoons. And this right here, the ranch mix will not have any sodium, but depending on what you do mix it with, we'll have some. But it's nice to compare and be in charge of what we fuel our bodies with. So with these blends I just gave you, it is very possible that you might not have every item on that list. So that is okay. You can experiment and substitute with a similar item. 
And it's fun to experiment, but we just kind of want to be careful when we experiment. And I've got a fun little poem here from an unknown source to kind of explain why we need to just maybe do one or two changes at a time. So here we go. I didn't have paprika, so I used another spice. I didn't have potatoes, so I substituted rice. I didn't have tomato sauce, so I used tomato paste, a whole can, not a half can. I don't believe in waste. A friend gave me this recipe and said, you just can't beat it. There must be something wrong with her. I can't even eat it. So right here kind of really explains that this a uh, very creative person who was just trying to make a delicious recipe from her friend changed too many things at once. With any kind of recipe, you want to stick to the recipe. If you don't have one of these blending um, items, then change one or two at first, but don't go as wild and experimental as this individual did. But it's just a fun little poem I like to share each time. People get a kick out of it. <laughs> So speaking of substituting, the general guidelines for dried herb, for dried to fresh herb ratio is one to four. And this ratio really comes in handy when you don't have both the fresh and dried version on hand, which a lot of us won't have. But I know that was a question in that somebody had asked. So one to four is about the ratio you want to stick with. So then if we are having a little fun and we are wanting to double a recipe, I just want to warn you, don't double the herbs and spices in it automatically along with every other ingredient. You want to increase the amount by one to one and a half first, taste it, try it out, and then add more if needed. You know, this might sound pretty basic and silly, but you can't take herbs and spices out, but you can always add more. And we want to keep this in mind, especially when we are putting in a spicy or something with bite. You really don't want to add too much. Add it in slowly. You can always add more. So add more delicate herbs a minute or two before the end of cooking or sprinkle on food just before you're ready to serve it up. And delicate herbs may lose more of their flavor when dried. And durable herbs may be added about the last 20 minutes of cooking. So right here, we've got the delicate herbs and durable herbs. And you can kind of tell what's durable and delicate just by looking at them. You know, if, if it's a seed or rosemary and thyme are um, pretty tough to break. But these other ones, basil, chives, cilantro, dill, those are pretty, the dill leaves are pretty easy to break up. So when you are adding your herbs and spices into a mix, you should already measure them out ahead of time so we're not cross-contaminating, but you don't want to be like this little guy here because what he's doing is he's shaking directly into a pot and that can have, that can cause the condensation to go right into your shaker. So that can create moisture and really unwanted bacteria. So using a dry spoon to measure out herbs and spices from the container will always be your best bet. I know it's tempting to do that, but really take the time and measure them out. So now on to drying herbs. Cassie had talked about harvesting a little bit, so now we're gonna take it to the next step. If you aren't just looking to buying your herbs and spices, but if you want to dry them and preserve them at home. Drying herbs is about the easiest method of preserving herbs. Um, leave the herbs in a well-ventilated area until the moisture evaporates. Sun drying isn't recommended because the herbs can lose flavor and color. Instead, we recommend to dry, air dry, oven dry, microwave driving, or using your dehydrator. And this is an uh, interesting tip, but very important. You want to label your herbs before you dry them because some time might pass, especially if we're air drying, because after they're dried, it might be tough to tell them apart. Uh, and also no matter which method you choose to dry your herbs, be sure they are completely dry before you stir store them so that we 
can prevent mold growth during the storage. So right here, we've got air drying, oven drying, microwave drying. Air drying, you are going to tightly tie bunches with a rubber band, hanging them in a warm, ventilated, dust-free, low-light area. And oven drying, there are um, different, I'm, I had some different resources that you guys are going to be able to get, but overall, your oven light or pilot light is going to be enough if you plan to do overnight drying. And microwave drying, it's really going to depend on your personal microwave. We've all got different microwave settings. We've got different microwave wattages and sizes. So really refer to your microwave directions, and you're going to want to dry your herbs in small quantities on this. And I know that dehydrating is a very popular method. So you're going to want to set your thermostat to 95 to 115 degrees, or if you are in an area with higher humidity, 125 degrees might be needed for that. And then after rinsing under cool running water and shaking to remove excess moisture, then you are going to place the herbs in a single layer on a dehydrator. And drying times are going to vary depending on what you are drying, so check them periodically. Now, freezing herbs. Freezing herbs can be done in a different, a couple different ways here, as shown in this photo in an ice cube tray, or by washing, patting dry, and wrapping a few sprigs of leaves in freezer wrap and placing in a freezer bag here. And if you use this ice cube tray method, you can cover them with extra virgin olive oil or with water. And then once they're frozen solid, you can pop them out and put them in a freezer safe baggie or a freezer safe container and use them whenever, whenever you would like. They're really nice to keep handy. So where do you store your herbs and spices? Think about where you've got them stored in your home right now. Well, it might change after learning this. The flavors of herbs and spices are delicate. So we wanna keep them as safe as we can to retain those delicious flavors and the colors that they have. So be sure to keep them away from light, heat, and moisture. Store them in tightly covered containers in a dark place and especially away from heat sources. So we wanna keep them away from our ranges, a heating vent, dishwashers, and sink. So if you have them over your stove, that might be handy when you're cooking, but you will wanna move them to retain those delicious flavors here. So even by a dishwasher, some people might have it in a dishwasher. Dishwashers get really warm and it's a humid space around that too. And uh, you can choose to refrigerate your paprika, chili powder, and red pepper also. So how long do we keep our herbs and spices? As a general rule, we want to keep our ground spices and herbs for one year and keep whole spices for two years. So do I have you guys wondering, how old are my herbs and spices? When is the last time I really revamped? what's in my cabinet. Well, we might want to overhaul our spice cabinet after this, but let's see if we really need to do that or not. So let's see. Here are some tips to tell if our herbs and spices are still good. So if it smells strong, it's usually still potent. So you can check herbs or ground spice by rubbing it in your hand and seeing how it smells. If it still smells how you would like it to smell, we're still good. You can check whole spices by breaking them up or crushing them or scraping them. But of course, we're not trying to burn our noses off and cause irritation. So be careful and just don't smell pepper or chili powders or anything hot. So here are some general tips here. You wanna purchase or preserve quality herbs and spices so that we're starting off ready to go with quality sources. Label your date of purchase on your container if you, or your date of preservation on your containers. So you're not wondering how long you've had something hanging out in your cupboards. And then buying smaller containers will also help too. Sometimes it might be a better deal if you buy a large one 
a large container, but just be sure you're going to use that whole container before you buy it. So here are some of the resources that we use that have helped Cassie and I throughout this uh, webinar to get ready, but then there are also so many others here. And these are going to be listed on that website. But then we really wanna thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope that you've learned so much about planting, caring for, and seasoning with new and favorite herbs and spices. We hope you've also had a lot of fun and had, um, and we really hope that you guys are ready to try new things, to try to garden and plant new herbs and spices, and then use them to jazz up your food. All right, thanks, Cassie and Ashley. I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca for the question and answer part. Yep, so I've got a few questions that I saved um, for you guys because I thought others might be interested as well. Um, the first question is probably a little more for Cassie, um, talking about cilantro and the harvesting process. And I think kind of the question is, it seems like you've harvested a couple of times and then it's done. So maybe talk a little bit about um, how cilantro grows. Sure, and I also saw that there was that discussion going on in the chat box. And it is hard because we have short springs in Kansas. It feels like we go from winter to summer really quick and cilantro really likes that cool season. So um, some tips would be to grow it more as a microgreen um, and then harvest every couple of weeks. You can keep planting them. So you're not just doing one planting, but spread it out. Um, yeah, if Dennis has any more on that, that he can he can mention that, but it, it is kind of hard with our our weather in Kansas. I also always remind people that the flowers of cilantro are edible. They're a little bit stronger flavor, and then the seed, even before it's dried, has great flavor too. So um, <clears throat> don't just think about the leaves. Um, next question, I think, is more for Ashley. Um, if you snip sh fresh chives and flash freeze to dry, can you store them in a jar at room temperature? Hmm. I, <laughs> I will need to check that specifically for chives. And if you could email me that question, I would be happy to get you an answer. Okay, uh, next question is um, wondering if there's any studies looking at uh, herbs and spices in the relationship to blood pressure and um, cholesterol levels, and also if any herbs or spices have known interactions with drugs. Well, with the known interactions with drugs, that is especially why we really recommend you to talk with your physicians to make sure that there's no interactions. Yeah, I can't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. Definitely talk, talk with your doctors and, um, and also on the recommendations from the earlier question, sometimes your doctor might recommend some, but just be on the same page with your doctor for any of those recommendations. Okay, and then um, another one with regards to like the seasoning mixes that you shared, Ashley, um, had some different folks kind of wondering about using fresh herbs in those seasoning mixes and if that changes the ratios or how you'd go about doing that or if you'd recommend drying them first. You can always dry them and then use whatever, um, whatever amount is listed, but if you do use a fresh herb with it, just use your ratio of one to four and it should taste, should taste good. Okay, there's a few other questions that have come into the chat so we can work through those. Um, any thoughts, Cassie, on herbs that will keep cats from digging up plants? Oh gosh, <laughs> I am not sure. I know you can, um, they do make like repel types of chemicals you can put around or like pepper powder around your plants to keep away cats and rabbits. Um, but I'm not sure if there's any specific herbs that, that keep cats away. Do you know, Rebecca? Um, I, 
I really don't now. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was some kind of, I remember a long time ago, they had a particular coleus or um, plectranthus that they were recommending to keep cats away, but that's been a long time ago. Maybe some of the other expert panelists have an opinion on that question. Um, Let's see, another question in the chat. Uh, uh, Cassie, I want to talk a little bit about the life cycle of parsley and why it bolts and the situation there. Sure, that, that's similar to the cilantro conversation we had and they just, when it gets so hot, it, it goes to seed um, and that can kind of make the leaves taste bitter. So if you can get it planted early or, or plant it several times throughout the spring and harvest it pretty young, that's, that's the best way to do it. The other thing to note with parsley in particular is that it's a biennial. And so sometimes it'll go through the first season and if it overwinters or depending on how it was grown before you get it, like if it goes through a cold spell, then it thinks it's time to produce seed. So that can happen sometimes too. So I think it's one o'clock, so. All right, well, I know we didn't make it through all the questions today, but there will be links to several articles that hopefully can answer your questions. Once again, thank you all for joining us for the K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We are so glad you could be here today to learn about herbs with us. We have several interesting sessions coming up in our summer series. Our next garden hour will be on May 19th. The topic is zeroscaping, beautiful landscapes with less water. Be sure to visit the K-State Garden Hour website to see all the upcoming topics as well as all of the recorded sessions. This session was recorded and will be posted on the website by tomorrow afternoon. After this webinar ends today, you will receive a prompt to take evaluation survey. Please fill this out as we would greatly appreciate your feedback. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at ksuemg at ksu.edu. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope you continue to tune in and join us on the K-State Garden Hour. I hope you all have a great rest of your week.